Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Texas Signal Signal Cast. I'm your host, Joe Desotel. I'm here by myself today. Jessica has a day off, but we're going to go ahead and jump right in and start talking about the state of the state of Texas is not too great and a lot of the same stuff really uh just a different day of course uh we got governor abbott putting his foot in his mouth on this issue over abortion and not understanding anything about i don't know human reproductive uh issues at all and uh we got more schools shutting down over covid we've got uh, another special session this one on redistricting but also a few other line items of sort of red meat for his base as we move into uh, beginning of primary season without a Democratic uh, announced candidate to challenge him. We're in some trouble, folks. We got to really get it together here. Uh, But basically, let's start from the top here. Over 5,000 Texans have died just in the last month from COVID-19. And you would think with a special session coming up, this would be a great time for Governor Abbott to roll back some of his latest bad ideas about preventing local jurisdictions from implementing mask mandates, vaccine mandates, companies that want to do the same and require masks in their businesses and require their employees to get the vaccine or wear masks or do testing if not. Uh, he's actually going to do the exact opposite. So along with redistricting put on this next special session of the legislature, Governor Abbott has also added the fact that he wants to prevent local jurisdictions like school boards and counties and cities from being able to implement mass mandates or vaccine mandates or vaccine passports. So in other words, you have to prove that you had the vaccine in order to attend an event that might be really crowded uh, and events that other people might not want to attend because they are are concerned about the level of people who are in fact unvaccinated, which we know is causing the actual spread of COVID-19 amongst those populations. And there are breakthrough cases. It's important to really understand and and sort of dig into a little bit about the breakthrough cases. The breakthrough case is simply someone who's been vaccinated but still gets uh, the virus. The important thing to know about it is that those folks are experiencing far less severe uh, you know, effects of the virus, but also they are getting it at less rate and they're transmitting it to others at a lower rate. And this is all very important because what we're seeing as it does spread amongst unvaccinated people is that they're the ones that are filling up our ICUs and spending all this time in the hospitals, really putting our healthcare workers not only at risk themselves, but they're exhausted. And a lot of folks who have what are considered to be elective surgeries are not able to have those uh, because they're just simply not the healthcare workers. And in response to this, instead of, again, pushing for more vaccinations and mask wearing, the governor has just put out a call uh, nationally to basically ship in healthcare workers to help uh, our overrun hospitals. And so that is not uh, leadership. Obviously, that's not what we should be doing. Uh, And further to the point, you know, in this new wave of the Delta variant and the others that are popping up, uh, because the more it goes out there and spreads, the more opportunity has to mutate. And that's what we're seeing happen. And so we have 45 school districts across the state of Texas that are shut down for in-person classes because they have too many faculty, too many teachers and substitute teachers who Uh, who have contracted uh, the virus and are unable to work and therefore students can't come in and they're, they're having a hard time finding substitute teachers to come in and replace those teachers. And who would, if you were a substitute teacher and you're getting paid just by the day to show up and they said, Hey, like we really need you because our school's overrun with COVID and our teachers are out sick when you want to come in and fill in for a couple of days. Yeah. It's going to be a little hard to find those folks. So That's what we're seeing. So the governor has said there will be no more shutdowns. Well, it's happening anyway. And it's not because we're trying to prevent the spread, but it's because the spread is out of control and folks uh, are having to shut down businesses, events, conferences. I mean, we mentioned this before on the show, but uh, the fact that the NRA refuses to come to Texas because of the spread is 
mildly ironic, um, given that the governor also has called this a sanctuary state for the Second Amendment. I guess not. It's more of a sanctuary state for COVID-19, apparently. So the other big thing that happened just in the last couple of days where Texas is making national news, I made a joke to a friend the other day that, you know, I had not been watching national news because I've been so enthralled and on the edge of my seat about what's going on here in Texas and really involved there that I really haven't turned on CNN or MSNBC. And I just did that uh, yesterday for the first time in probably a month. And sure enough, the only thing they want to talk about other than Afghanistan is Texas. What's going on in Texas? What's going on with all these COVID-19 cases? What's going on with the voter suppression bill? What's going on with this new abortion rule that just went into effect? And we're already seeing huge blowback uh, on the abortion bill as well. So U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland has announced that he will file a lawsuit against Texas as early as Thursday. Today is Thursday, so we should see something very soon, uh, basically trying to protect uh, women's uh, right to choose. And he's doing it based on what's called the FACE Act, uh, which essentially is there to protect access to uh, to uh, healthcare facilities, uh, you know, for uh, for people across the board, and, and in this case, uh, for the right, a woman has to get an abortion. We've talked about this bill a lot, and what it does essentially allow anyone to sue uh, someone uh, if they suspect even that they had anything to do with the process of someone going to get an abortion, whether they're the, the Uber driver or the doctor uh, or a husband who drove, you know, a woman there, uh, any of that. So, Basically, uh, Governor Abbott was being interviewed about this and they were asking him questions and saying, well, there's no exception for uh, women who get pregnant because of rape or incest. And interestingly, uh, Abbott was like trying to, I guess, say that that's not true. Uh, the case he made uh, to push back on that was that, you know, women who get raped still have six weeks to get an abortion if they want one. Um, of course, a lot of people will push back on that because most women don't know they're pregnant until at least the fourth, fifth or sixth week. And so at the most uh, women are going to have is about two weeks to be able to make that decision. And in the state of Texas, it's already been made so difficult to get an abortion that uh, you have to actually go uh, make multiple visits. Uh, there's a waiting period. And so everything that they've done is essentially to prevent women from, from exercising that right. And, um, and what we're finding now is that neighboring states uh, are already overwhelmed uh, in their clinics. And we're actually having to send uh, our healthcare workers now uh, to other states to help uh, facilitate uh, the healthcare that women are trying to get in other states because they can't do it in Texas. And another theme that is constant on this podcast and really throughout our reporting is how these decisions that these Republican men mostly white Republican men who are making at the state level has a tremendous negative effect on all Texans, but particularly heavy on people of color and then women of color. And then what we're seeing from this particular law and what we're hearing from those uh, who uh, who are uh, dealing with this on a daily basis, uh, basically is what they're telling us is that uh, the, the women who uh, who have gone out of state to receive abortion services are predominantly wealthy and predominantly white. And so that means that, you know, women of color who, uh, who are working full time and may not have the capacity to travel uh, and, uh, to another state and things like that are the ones that are going to be most adversely affected here. And that is typical of basically everything we're seeing them try to do. And we do think that it's intentional. And so uh, whether it is uh, the abortion issue or redistricting, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, we certainly saw it with the voting rights, uh, the voting voter suppression bill that they just passed. Uh, the whole intention there is to reduce the number of people who can vote, and particularly in, in dense urban areas, in the ways that are most convenient in the ways that they've proved to have done so in the past easily. And so uh, that's what all that is about. And you know, one after another down the list, that's what these bills are doing. And, um, and so it doesn't seem to be completely lost on folks that that's what's happening. 
but it continues and it will continue until we can elect somebody to uh, to push back on this stuff, unless we have a, a majority in the legislature or unless we start taking over some statewide offices. And again, you know, Democrats have yet to put up a candidate to challenge Governor Abbott next November. And so what's happening is the only people that are having any type of influence on him are those to the right of him. And they're pulling him further and further to the right and away from uh, what most Texans think and believe. And hopefully that will include voting Texans next November. And we know this because, you know, we talk to a lot of people every day, but we also have seen some of these polls and the polls show that what they're doing on voting rights and abortion rights, uh, people do not support. Most Texans don't support that. And so when they alter the voting rights, that just gives them the ability to pass more unpopular legislation because they'll, they are allowing themselves to be less accountable to voters. And so, you know, one of the things that one of the pushbacks we saw with Abbott's comments on, on uh, saying that women, you know, who are victims of rape still have six weeks is Obviously, you have most people saying, well, you know, women don't even know that they're pregnant yet. But on the far right and the people who have been attacking him from that that flank, pushing him further to the right are saying basically like, you know, how dare you advocate abortion up until six weeks, whether women are pregnant or not or have been are victims of rape or not. And so they, you know, it just shows that it doesn't really matter how far to the right these folks go who are in power, there will always be their base trying to push them further and further and further to the right. Uh, And, 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 you know, in, you know, uh, taking away people's rights in these different areas that they feel like they should be able to have control over people. And so, you know, that's just one of the things, you know, that we saw uh, after he made those comments, Uh, you saw um, some of Trump's uh, former attorneys, uh, who are, you know, big and MAGA world grifter types, basically calling Abbott a rhino for these statements. And we saw his primary opponents in the, in the gubernatorial race who are challenging him in the Republican primary say the exact same thing and use this as an opportunity to say he's just not really pro-life because of, uh, because he, you know, is, is advocating that women who are victims of rape actually terminate their pregnancy. And the other thing that he said that was just really goofy and dumb was that um, basically he said to this to this question, well, we're going to eliminate rape. And as it turns out, we haven't done that. And he's been governor for a long time. In fact, before he was governor, he was attorney general. And that would have been the place to really do something about it. And as it turns out, Texas, more than California, a state with a population that's about 25% more than Texas, Texas still has more reported rapes than any other state in the union. So he's obviously not doing a very good job of, of doing that, not to mention, uh, as other advocates point out, a lot of uh, rape victims actually know uh, their uh, victimizers. And it is not a, this, the case, as he tried to say, that uh, the rapists are out in the streets. And so we're going to clean up the streets and we're going to get rapists off the streets. Uh, the fact is, sometimes they're already in the homes. And that's this is why people don't just say rape. They also say incest. And, and so these are you know things that people don't even want to think about um, or talk about especially. And so that's how they kind of get away with, with, uh, with doing these types of things and, and, um, you know, villainizing the actual victims in these circumstances. And so, um, you know, so Abbott took a lot of flack for, for both those comments, uh, the comments, um, about the, the six weeks abortion and also about the, uh, how he plans to quote unquote eliminate rape. And we know in Texas, we fought very hard to even get the backlog of rape kits that we do have currently processed. And that's something that the state has not done a good job on and, and continues to, uh, to be an issue. And so, yeah, it's just, it's exhausting. But um, so that basically those bills went into effect on September 1st. And then less than a week later, this special session where we pass some of this stuff uh, is actually uh, expired. And so now the governor has stated that he's going to call another special session. This one was going to focus on redistricting because as many of you probably know, uh, this, the lines of which politicians have to run in um, are uh, changed depending on how people move according to the census. 
And so after we just had our census, now we've got to go and redraw these political lines. And of course, they're going to just draw them to protect their Republican incumbents and potentially uh, take out some vulnerable Democrats. And so that's what we uh, are preparing to do right now. Uh, there were hopes that uh, f- the federal government and, and Democrats at the federal level would pass a bill uh, that would, pr- would do more to protect voting rights and to stop these types of attacks on voting rights, uh, including on redistricting and setting up independent redistricting commissions and things like that to prevent this type of partisan gerrymandering. Fortunately, nothing like that has happened yet. And so we are still holding out hope that we can, you know, uh, get a break in the filibuster rule so that we can pass some federal voting rights legislation. And uh, so far that has not happened, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, redistricting is not the only thing that's on the governor's call. And of course, he can add anything to that at any time, which means the more these kind of right wing folks get in his ear, the more likely it is that he's going to put some more bad stuff on there. And so some of the other things that they've been trying to do but have not been able to accomplish as far that he put on the call other than redistricting uh, are the uh, transgender sports bill which essentially would ban as as students from participating in sports uh, uh, with the uh, teams that don't allow uh, align with their uh, their gender uh, as marked on their birth certificate and so i mean the amount of folks that this uh, impacts is minuscule, uh, but it is it just tells you uh, how far they will go uh, to push these really bad policy ideas. And they don't really care. Again, uh, victims, uh, students who are probably teased, made fun of, and bullied in school are now being teased, made fun of, and bullied by the politicians and the people who lead the state. And it's just you know, an, another example of the links that they're willing to go to uh, for primary votes. And so that's something that they felt like they have to do. And then the other thing uh, that I mentioned before was the COVID mandates. And so he wants to uh, codify in law that local jurisdictions cannot implement, implement uh, mask mandates, cannot uh, require vaccine mandates, or vaccine passports that just simply show that you have in fact been vaccinated before you can attend an event or enter uh, into a building or pay, uh, patronize a business. And so this is, uh, this is his response when Texas and Florida combined make up something like 40% of all co- new COVID cases uh, in, in the country. And so it, it is really the opposite direction that we need to go in. And again, the polls that we saw recently show that Texans actually trust their local officials to make these decisions more than the state because of how poorly the state has handled them. And this is obviously a a pushback, uh, the governor trying to take more power and in some ways share the blame for how unpopular this is because he did it as an executive order. And so that's really 100% on him. But if he can get the legislature to also approve uh, no mandates for COVID, then he can sort of spread the blame and say, well, it's not just me. The legislature passed this bill, but only the governor can put issues on the call. So again, 100% on Greg Abbott. So that brings us to our last topic, which is essentially who is running for office here in Texas and who is challenging some of these Republicans. And so far, as we mentioned, none at the statewide level. There's a growing concern in conversation uh, in sort of the uh, insider class of Texas progressive politics that uh, Beto is may or may not run. He's still considering it. He's talking to people or whatever. But the bottom line is that uh, what people are saying out there, and it's on social media and folks are talking about it, but that no one will step up to run for governor as a Democrat unless Beto explicitly says he is not running because obviously nobody wants to challenge him in the primary because they don't think they will win in the primary. Whether they think Beto will win in the general is a whole nother question, but you can't get there if you can't get through the primary. And so, you know, I think what people really would like to see from Beto is either him announce that he's running for governor or announce that he's not running for governor. And that would sort of clear the field or at least give a date and, 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 and say like, hey, 
you know, by September 30th or October 30th or whatever, I will, uh, I will have my decision and I'll make my decision. So that is, I think, what a lot of folks are, are waiting for and hoping for. In the meantime, there are a lot of other statewide positions that we uh, need to, uh, to, to fill. Uh, we have Mike Collier, who has run before. He's going to be running for lieutenant governor against Dan Patrick. Uh, we have uh, Joe Jaworski, who has announced uh, that he is running against uh, our currently indicted Attorney General Kim Paxton, who Joe Jaworski is uh, actually been making his way around the state uh, for the past few months, actually, has a, a pretty solid uh, following on social media, actually, if you check him out. Um, I'm still waiting on his announcement for fundraising numbers, uh, but I'm sure we'll get that in the next few days. However, there's another candidate on the Democratic side who has also announced that he's running for attorney general. His name is Lee Merritt. He's from the Dallas area. He's a civil rights attorney. He actually happened to outraise all of the Republican candidates uh, for this position. He raised $285,000 and Ken Paxton himself only raised $39,000. And the, his two primary opponents, uh, George P. Bush, who is currently the land commissioner of Texas, uh, reported raising 157000 And uh, former Supreme Court Justice uh, Guzman uh, has raised 193000 Now, she is actually probably the only one who's actually qualified to hold this position. Uh, she is a, she's very, very smart. In fact, if, if all things were fair, she'd be the only one I'd be even concerned about but it's not. And it's likely that uh, more than anything, I think Ken Paxton is still the favorite to win this. Uh, in fact, he was endorsed by former President Donald Trump, and he's going to run with that endorsement, obviously. Uh, George P. Bush did everything, including throwing his own family under the bus to try to get it, and he didn't get it. Uh, in fact, it's kind of funny. The only thing he did get from Trump is a nickname. He calls him My Bush. Uh, which is pretty hilarious because there was a TV show called That's My Bush about his uncle, uh, George Bush, at one point in time, probably dating myself. But anyways, uh, so Lee Merritt um, is, is sort of a newer entrant into this race. I haven't seen a lot from his campaign yet, but that's pretty impressive fundraising numbers. So we'll see what's going to happen there. And I think uh, I have to mention that attorney Ken Paxton, who is uh, still currently indicted, just had sort of a, a new announcement in the six year long running saga of his indictment, where essentially the court ruled in his favor that he can move his trial uh, back to his home county, uh, as opposed to Harris County, where it prosecutors had wanted to move it to because, well, they think it's kind of unfair uh, to have this guy who was a local politician before he was a statewide politician essentially go into his own home, home turf um, and sit in front of, you know, judges and, and other folks that he knows really well and, and get a fair shot uh, at, at justice. And so they were trying to move the venue. He, of course, is doing everything he can to bring it back home uh, to uh, where he is from um, and in and, and North Texas, I think it's Collin County. So ongoing saga there. Uh, folks should also know that he is currently not only um, been indicted on securities fraud, he is also currently under investigation by the FBI after most of his top attorneys in the AG's office quit together, uh, basically said he was abusing his office on totally unrelated issues to why he's indicted on securities fraud. But um, they, you know, they've asked the FBI to look into it. Apparently they are. And so we haven't gotten an update on that, but we'll continue to follow that as well. None of this seems to matter. Obviously, Trump probably looks at this as a, uh, you know, some type of a badge of honor, uh, you know, being being investigated by the FBI. Um, and so that didn't, of course, phase his uh, his endorsement. And it doesn't seem to be the case for anyone in MAGA world that they are concerned about any of the illegal, act, allegedly illegal activities that Kim Paxson is involved in. It's also of note that his wife is a sitting state senator uh, from that same area where he's trying to get his uh, his trial moved back to. So. Whew.
a lot going on still. And all these things are, are really important that we just kind of keep tabs on them. So we'll continue to do that for you. And, you know, all we ask is that you get involved and, you know, like our, you know, material, of course, you know, share it, read it, but take that next step, figure out how to get involved in your local Democratic Party, uh, find a local nonprofit that's doing good work on voter registration or something like that. Just get involved in some way because those all those little efforts add up across the state. And, and it's the only way we're going to hold these folks accountable. And always remember that if you think that your vote doesn't count, these guys wouldn't be working so hard to take it away from you. And so they are. And so we have to respond in kind to that and make sure that we have the numbers come next November to really change the direction of the state, which we have the numbers on our side in terms of how people feel. That poll that I mentioned earlier also said that most Texans think that our state is moving in the wrong direction and our leadership needs to change. So that's that's where we're at, folks. Um, thanks again for listening. And, you know, check us out, texassignal.com. If you're so inclined, you can uh, go there, look at the top right, become a Patreon member. Basically, your small monthly donation will help to uh, sustain this type of progressive journalism that we do here. It's so badly needed in the state of Texas. And, um, you know, make sure to join the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, or TikTok. Uh, we're there. So glad to have you. Glad to keep doing this. Uh, thanks again. And until next time, I'll later, y'all.